Hello Elix30, this is Michael, and we are in How to Be Human, An Autistic Man's Guide to Life by Jory Fleming with Lyric Winnick. We are now starting Chapter 8, entitled Things That Matter, and we are on page 145. Talking about friendship. As a child, friendship was elusive for Jory. He had one good friend, James, who lived down the block. In high school and college, Jory began to expand that group. But he still finds genuine friendship a challenge. However, the heartfelt genuineness of his vision of friendship could in many ways be seen as a challenge for all of us. What is true friendship? What do we ask of our friends, and what do we hope for from our friendships? What kind of friend is each of us? L.W. Who are the important people in your life, and what makes them important? Jory. For the people that I've known the longest, it's definitely that they were willing to put up with the challenges. When we moved to South Carolina, I was five, and James, who lived down the street, was also five. And only a limited subset of five-year-olds would be willing to put up with me, and it just happened to be the case that James was one of those subsets. The same with Nancy, who is our neighbor across the street. I don't really recall this, but I've heard this from other people, that she put in a lot of time coming over and essentially allowing me to get used to her. The first few times Mom left me at her house, I was very unhappy with that arrangement, and it took some time for that dynamic to alter. Most people would be really quite frustrated with that, and not everybody would be willing to tolerate that. Generally, I feel like I have more female friends than male friends. I've never really thought about why that's the case probably they are just easier to talk to. At the University of South Carolina, the majority of my mentors and friends were female. At Oxford, the people I have hung out with are less sporty. Sports are huge there. Some people do sports all the time. But for a lot of my friend choices, I feel like they, excuse me, let me start that sentence again. But for a lot of my friend choices, I don't feel they have anything to do with autism in particular. L.W. What makes friendship a challenge for you? Jory. Because I'm on a different wavelength, or whatever you want to call it, I don't feel like people can get to know me very well or very easily. I feel like a big part of friendship is feeling like you know a person, and then you know what matters to them, and you know various things about them and how they react and what they're like. You know their personality, their values. When you have some level of trust, then people share something that they would not have shared otherwise. It's tied into vulnerability or real thoughts. Anytime you can get to real thoughts as opposed to small talk, or trust, or create a shared value, that is always worth it. It only happens in person, too. You can maybe do it over video calling or Skype, but really 
in person is where you get those things, at least as I've found it. I don't really form first impressions. The picture is always going to start off really bad because it takes me a while. I can carry on a conversation with almost anyone, but as far as feeling like I know that person, well, to get from that basic level to anything else, it probably takes about seven or eight separate interactions of at least 20 to 30 minutes. And only after a few months will I know some stuff about them. L.W. Why do you feel that separation from other people? Why do you think it is such a challenge for them to get to know you or you to get to know them? Jory. The best way I can describe it is as sort of a floating island. You can see it fine. There's not a big chasm in between. The island I'm on is really small, but you're not there. You're still on your island. I can see you, and you can see me. And we can order telescopes and see each other in detail. But it's different because we're not standing on the same ground. And while there isn't that much difference, it's still different ground. Some differences are not going to be intelligible to either side because we don't have a soil sampler that can reach across the chasm. We only have things like telescopes or other methods of observation. L.W. Are you saying that our two islands were created by the same volca volcano and that if you drill down, we will share the soil sample? Or are you saying that my island was cr created by a different volcano and my, my soil sample is never going to match up with yours? That while it might look the same, and while our islands, our islands might look the same from each of our telescopes, we are not actually standing on the same ground. Jory. Even islands created from the same volcano blast drift apart on geologic time. Part of me wants to say, yeah, it's a different volcano, and so it's a vastly different chemical signature. Then there's another part that says, well, I'm not so sure. It could be the same volcano, but separate eruptions that created two distinct masses, with one mass, yours, being significantly bigger. For you, everybody's on the same island, and you have all these things that make communication easier. You have the subconscious, social contracts, and culture, and the meanings of language, which everybody knows about. You might not have to think about it, because if everybody around you is not thinking about it, then why bother thinking about it yourself? L.W. Do you think it would be hard to have a very emotional friend? Are you drawn to people who are more logical and restrained? Jory. It's super ironic, but I think I actually communicate fairly well with both types. The more emotional type person usually considers me a really great listener. And that's because I have no idea what's going on with them. And I do probably listen well. So that's pretty hilarious. My responses are hilariously optimal 
because I ask them to elaborate on their feelings. Or I just kind of say, oh, thank you very much for sharing. With people who are not emotional, I don't usually bring up emotions. We just talk about cool stuff. So it meshes with them, too. Through no intention or skill on my own behalf, I tend to be reasonably okay commuting, communicating with a cross-section of people. If you're kind of bad at communicating anyway, it's not like you're better at communicating with one specific group of people and you gravitate toward them. I'm bad at communicating with anyone. But other people don't really notice that. They think I'm very uniform in how I communicate with people, but it's that I have a pretty low level across the board. L.W. What mystifies you about friendship? Jory. One thing I find very hard to grasp is why in any situation, even if you were trying to get ahead, you would treat another person as a means to an end rather than as an end in themselves. The logical thing would be that people prefer to be treated as an end to themselves and not as a rung on someone else's ladder. But I think quite a lot of people actually see conversations and interactions with people as being a means to some end. It's very confusing because the goal is disturbing. Is it a choice? I don't think it's a choice because people don't really think about it. But it begs the question, what part of your brain is deciding that for you? Why you will not find Jory networking. Jory, I definitely feel like in many ways I'm not the typical Rhodes Scholar profile. I have difficulty networking because it's a social environment. Every few months, Rhodes House will have meat and mingles, which is exactly what it sounds like. Everybody's in one room, and you mingle. It's just not something that I really do. As a result, I know numerically less people than some of the other scholars. But on the other hand, I feel like I actually know the Rhodes Scholars that I hang out with and play board games with pretty well, and the coding group I joined, and a few other people who I intentionally try to meet up with on a semi-regular basis. And the porters and staff at Rhodes House. That might be about a dozen people, but I feel like I've gotten to know them, and we have conversations that are really meaningful and interesting. I've interacted with the community less than other people, but I feel like I've had a lot of value to the interactions that I have had. So, I don't think I would really change anything, because it's not like you could ever make a meet and mingle super open or friendly to somebody with autism, but they should definitely still run them. Talking about the value of an autistic person. Differences and deficits frequently dominate a conversation about autism. 
But one thing Jory is very clear on is that he would not change his present state. I asked him in various ways to discuss the value of autism and also how relevant the concept of autism is to him as he engages with the world. L.W. How do you perceive autism in terms of both yourself as an individual and in terms of the larger stereotypes that exist? Jury. Finishing college and going to Oxford brought me to a realization that I'm not ever going to let myself be defined by other people because I have autism or any other disability. It's not arrogant to me. I already know who I am. It's just you don't understand some things about me in the same way that I don't understand things about you. But that also doesn't mean that we can't have a shared vision or act collectively toward a goal. It's a good thing to recognize people for their talents, and I definitely think that in many cases the people called autistic savants are amazing by any measure at what they do, piano or math or whatever it is. That's something unique and really nice to value. I feel like as long as it doesn't become oh, this autistic person, this autistic person, this autistic person isn't a savant, therefore they're less valuable, it's fine. As long as it doesn't become that. I'm not at an extra level in any one particular thing like that. But that doesn't mean that I think of myself as having a less talented version of autism, or I'm not as smart, right? But autistic savant has an almost positive stereotype associated with it. People are witnessing something so magical that the benefits outweigh the differences. Whereas, when they see other people with autism, they focus on the differences and not the benefits. They don't see them as easily, or maybe don't consider them to be beneficial. And we'll stop this video here.